And so the, this morning I entitled the sermon, All Means All, and That's All All Means. Uh, that's one word that, that we know, and it has that one meaning. It means everything, everybody. And uh, so what we're going to talk about today is prayer in the church. Uh, we, we know that prayer is, is that activity we participate in as individuals and also as a congregation. And so uh, remember that the Apostle Paul in, in chapter 2 of uh, 1 Timothy is talking about uh, the activity of prayer uh, as a congregational activity. I, uh, I've been uh, watching the news sporadically. It's pretty depressing when you, you uh, stop and, and consider what's going on. And uh, uh, I've been spending a lot more time listening to Bible studies and sermons and, and uh, people talking about the Lord. And that has uh, helped me to, to maintain a kind of a positive attitude about all of it. So. Uh, uh, one of the people that I, I like to listen to is Tony Evans. I consider Tony Evans, the African-American preacher, as uh, one of the uh, premier preachers uh, in the United States uh, today. Uh, he, uh, he always uh, seems to, to uh, hit the nail on the head uh, intelligently and, and uh, very, very uh, uh, graphically. He's a great communicator, and uh, he's been talking a lot about uh, uh, what's going on in our nation with all of the, the racial unrest and so forth. And uh, in, in one of his uh, talks, he said this, and I quote, we are in a medical pandemic right now. Simultaneously, we're in a cultural pandemic because we have seen the devolution of our society. We are in a cultural pandemic because we are in a spiritual pandemic. We have wandered away from a value system that was established by God for how human beings were to live and act and relate to one another across racial and class lines. We have come up with our own standards, and it has not done us good. Tony Evans. I agree with what he is saying, and so recognizing that if we're going to make any positive changes, medically, culturally, and spiritually, it has to begin with a return to the Lord. And the church is tasked with a great task, and that is to pray and to lift our hearts to God in this particular situation. So the first thing I want you to see in Second Tim, or First Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse number 1, is that we have a command and that is to pray for all men. And so the, the Apostle Paul says in verse number one, I mean, he starts right out talking about prayer. He says, first of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. And so it, it's quite interesting that uh, he, it, it looks like he uh, was thinking of Daniel chapter 6, where Daniel, uh, whenever he realizes uh, that he needs uh, to go to the Lord in prayer, it says, uh, Daniel entered his house, and he continued three times a day praying and giving thanks before his uh, God. Men came and found Daniel making petition and supplication before the Lord. Daniel in Hebrew uses uh, the same concepts that Paul does in Greek about praying. And, and so Paul is saying, uh, you are as a church to entreat God, to lift up entreaties, requests, 
and and we are to ask for things that we find needful in our lives and right now it seems to me that two things that are very needful in our lives is uh, the relief from this medical pandemic and we as a church ought to be praying that uh, God would uh, uh, help people find a cure for this and to to move us on beyond it and the other thing is the cultural pandemic that we're in and obviously the first thing we can do about all of this racial unrest is that we can pray no matter where we are we as a church need to be praying that God's will would uh, overcome the hatred and the violence that, uh, that we see going on uh, today. And so entreaties are requests, prayers. This is the, the word that is most often used in the New Testament for prayer. In fact, uh, uh, the word in Greek is prosuke, and it's never used for anything other than asking God for help. And then petitions, uh, petitions are intercessions. And uh, we as a congregation need to be interceding for our community and our world in its, in its unrest. And uh, so also thanksgiving. Uh, we have the right to bring our request to God, but we also have the duty to bring thanksgiving to him. Because when we pray, not only do we ask for God to, to help us, but we're also giving thanks that we know God is helping us and that he is in charge and he's going to, to make it uh, come about in his perfect will. Uh, I, I read a little poem the other day. It said, thou art coming to the king. Large petitions do we bring. For his grace and power are such that one can never ask too much. We, uh, we need to, as a church, be boldly praying that God would bring his solution about, and we can pray that he would do so in a timely manner. And uh, so the first thing is that are the four prayers, uh, four pillars of prayer for all men, entreaties, prayers, petition, and thanksgiving. This is a command to the church. It's also incumbent upon us as individuals to pray for these things. But it's, it's definitely what Paul is talking about. In this particular situation, he's talking about congregational prayer. And so in verses, uh, the last part of verse 1 and verse 2, the focus of public prayer, it should be made on behalf of all men, and then specifically for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. So there is a comprehensiveness about our, our prayer. We ought to be praying for all men. But then he goes on in verse number two and gives us this, this uh, a specific case for our focus, for kings and those who are in, in authority. Now, the Bible does not teach the divine right of kings. In other words, that uh, they are, are somehow divine, but it does teach the divine will for governments. God is in charge, and God has placed kings, presidents, and uh, prime ministers, those who are in authority over us. It is his will that we have a government that allows us to, to uh, have uh, everything that, that we're needed. Uh, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God, Romans 13.1. And so uh, we recognize that even though we don't really appreciate everything that our government does, that uh, we need to recognize that God has placed them in authority over us. When I was working uh, for the Nevada Baptist Convention, after uh, I was named uh, the executive director for the, the group, uh, we, we had a large parking lot 
in the back of our building and uh, some of the other uh, people in the area used our parking lot. And in fact, the, the attorneys next door to us, uh, the attorneys next door to us, uh, I'm sorry, I've got a, they should be on doors, I'm sorry. Uh, the attorneys next door to us, uh, one of the guys had on uh, his car a bumper sticker and uh, it, it said, uh, George W. is not my president. And since they were using our parking lot for free, I asked him to uh, take the bumper sticker off of his car and he refused. And I said, okay, you park someplace else. Uh, so uh, he, he finally did take the bumper sticker off. No matter if we, we like George W. or uh, President Obama or President uh, uh, whoever, it means that these people are in authority over us and it's our responsibility to pray for them. President Trump deserves our prayers. So does Governor Sislak. So does our mayors in our various communities. I would mention one mayor, but I'd have to, to mention the mayors of at least six different communities uh, around. So uh, we, are, we are definitely uh, told to be praying for those who are in authority. Now, just because we don't uh, uh, care for all that they do doesn't mean that we can, cannot pray for them. And in fact, uh, in the first century, uh, when Paul was writing this, Nero was the emperor. And uh, he was a pretty bad dude. And uh, later Domitian, who was probably, as far as the persecution of Christians, even, even worse than Nero, uh, and yet uh, they were in, uh, told that they sh should pray for the uh, person that was in charge. Tertullian, a Christian author, uh, lived from 155 to 240 uh, AD, and uh, he wrote, Christians should pray for the emperor, long life, a uh, secure dominion, a safe home, a faithful senate, a righteous people, and a world at peace. And uh, that, I believe, is, is uh, totally our responsibility to be a part of, of that uh, situation. I'm sorry, I'm having technical difficulties here. We have to... Okay, I think I got everybody back on. Okay, uh, so uh, God approves... Christians praying publicly, especially for all men, specifically for our leaders. In verse number three, he said, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Christians don't pray to please themselves or to please each other, but we pray to please God. <laughs> when uh, a few years ago, when uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson was the president. Bill Moyers uh, was his speechwriter and had been invited to the family quarters in the White House to observe a meal with the, uh, the Johnson family. And uh, the president asked uh, Bill to uh, uh, offer uh, a prayer. And uh, as he prayed, uh, he was praying very softly. The president interrupted him and said, speak up, Bill, speak up. And the former Baptist minister, East Texas Baptist minister, stopped in mid-sentence and without looking up, uh, replied, I wasn't addressing you, Mr. President. In fact, uh, I think that should be our attitude in prayer. We, uh, we are not praying to entertain others. We are praying to glorify God. And we're praying in accordance with his will. So, uh, why did the Apostle Paul say that you need to be praying as a congregation? Well, it's because there was a desire, and the desire was that all men would be saved. In verses 4 and 5, we see that God has a plan for all men. Uh, the plan was in verse 4, uh, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, what is truth? 
there are a couple of places in the Bible, especially in the Gospel of John, where uh, truth is defined for us. John 14, 6, truth is the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the truth. And I'm sorry, I am having awful, awful time with Okay, I just have to go on. Uh, if if somebody is dropped off, I am so sorry. I am I can't get back on. So just we'll just go on. So uh, uh, the plan of God is that all men would be saved and that they come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus is the truth. John sixteen thirteen. The Holy Spirit is the truth. Uh, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. So truth is Jesus, truth is the Holy Spirit, and truth is the word of God. John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And so God desires all men to come to the truth, to come to the, the knowledge of, of the salvation of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing, just because God desires all to be saved, he does not guarantee all will be saved. Because you see, we have to make a decision whenever Jesus offers us free salvation we have to accept it. And so uh, uh, the desire of God is for all men to be saved. And uh, so we have an opportunity then because he has offered us salvation to accept that for ourselves. And then uh, the only way to God for all men is through Jesus Christ. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it says there is... In verse number five, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. There is only one way. Now, remember back whenever we were in the book of Job, we were talking about in, in chapter number nine, uh, Job was looking for one mediator. Uh, in fact, he said, uh, there is no umpire between us who may lay his hand upon us both. Uh, Job was looking for someone to be a go-between between between him and God so that he could uh, express his, uh, his needs before God. And uh, so he's saying, I long for a mediator that would, uh, would help us through this terrible time. In, a, in the Ephesian church, because of this this brand of Gnosticism, uh, they they thought that there were many emanations between God and man. In other words, God was so holy that he had to have a number of go-betweens before he got uh, down to man. And so uh, the false teachers in Ephesus taught that there were a multitude of mediators. It went from Job saying there is no mediator to the Ephesian church saying there's a multitude of mediators. And the apostle Paul says, uh, listen, let's take a time out here and let's recognize that there is one mediator and that one mediator is indeed the man, Christ Jesus. The, he is the only mediator. So, uh, the third thing that we want to see is that this mediator, this Christ, paid a ransom. The ransom, Christ paid himself for all men. In verse number six, the, the price that uh, uh, Jesus Christ paid, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. And that's where the title of the sermon comes from. All means all, and that's all, all means. And uh, so Jesus gave himself for 
a ransom for all men. Now, all challenges those who espouse a limited atonement. It, it, it really just says that Christ gave a ransom for all. Now, not all people will accept that ransom. You see, there has to be a decision, a belief, putting our trust in the Lord. Uh, and so uh, the herald, Christ called to announce his reputation in verse number seven. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And so the apostle Paul is saying, I've been commissioned to tell people about this ransom that Jesus has made. Uh, C.T. Studd uh, wrote a little poem, and he said, Some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. And uh, so we as a church recognize that we are the ones that are to uh, proclaim the fact that Christ gave himself as a ransom for salvation. And in order to do that, I know that I have to have I have to have the ability to, uh, to uh, proclaim that boldly. And the only way I can do that is through prayer. If I don't have the strengthening of prayer, I can be a very, very timid evangelist. And so as the church prays for itself and prays for its people to be able to reach out and tell people about Christ, therein lies our strength. The ransom Christ paid was himself that he paid for all men. And so the, the fourth thing that I would have you see in this passage of Scripture is the procedure, the manner in which all men should pray. In verse number eight, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. So the first part, Pray by lifting holy hands. Now, there's a number of places in the Bible that it talks about the posture for prayer. And uh, one place is standing with outstretched arms. In 1 Kings chapter 8, uh, then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of the assembly of Israel and spread his hands out toward heaven. In Daniel chapter 6, we find that kneeling is, is a, a way to uh, a posture for prayer. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had a windowless window open toward Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he'd been doing previously. Another attitude for prayer is sitting. In uh, 2 Samuel 7, then David the king went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? And so even sitting is a correct attitude for prayer. Bowing of the head, Genesis chapter 24. Uh, then the man bowed low and worshiped the Lord. Lifting of the eyes in John 17, 1, Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. And so lifting up the eyes, falling on the ground in Genesis 17, and Abram fell on his face and the Lord talked with him saying, so there's all kinds of attitude or uh, physical attitudes uh, whereby uh, we can offer up prayers to God. One of the things that we always talk about is that we bow our heads and close our eyes and fold our hands. And that really uh, is, is probably not as scriptural as standing and with stretching our arms up to heaven and looking up into heaven uh, seems to be uh, the attitude of prayer that uh, uh, is, is most uh, 
found in the New Testament and even uh, in the Old Testament. And so uh, uh, the attitudes of prayer. Now, I know why we, we pray and close our eyes. We do that so that all of the external things around us will be blotted out and uh, we can we can concentrate our attention on God. So I'm sure that that God finds it appropriate also for us to pray with our eyes closed and uh, so forth and, and our, our hands folded. The hands folded is kind of a, a European thing of obeisance to, uh, uh, to a monarch. And so again, it's appropriate because it's part of our custom, but uh, uh, recognize that uh, the important thing is not just the, the posture of prayer, but the fact that we actually practice prayer, that we're, we're about it. And the second thing, not only lifting up holy hands, but to pray without dissension. And uh, uh, about, actually before that, uh, without anger, the word is ogre, and it is uh, the, the word for an ogre, to someone that, that uh, has lost control of their emotions and is, is angry. And uh, so Paul says that we're to pray without anger. And then the last thing is to pray without dissension. And uh, that word dissension is an interesting word. Uh, it, uh, it, whenever you think about it, there's an exterior dimension to dissension, and that would be arguments and fights. Uh, and then the, the interesting thing is that this word dissension also means doubt. And so what Paul is saying, that we ought to pray uh, without strife, and we ought to pray without doubt. Pray in faith, knowing that God is in control, God is answered, and God will bring about his perfect will in our lives. So in conclusion, I think what the Apostle Paul is talking about in this passage of Scripture is how the church ought to pray. And so three things, I think, are important that Paul is saying. First of all, the church must pray. And the second thing is, the church must pray for people. And the third thing is, the church must be praying for people to be saved. So when we keep those things in mind, I believe that we're on the right track as far as prayer. Let's pray together.